Hello everyone and welcome back to another reaction. Today we're doing something a bit different. We're getting away from Europe a bit at least and we're taking a look at the conquest of India. Now this is a topic I don't know too much about. I do know the basics about the British conquest and uh, I guess we'll see the details in this series hopefully. Without further ado, let's get going. Delhi, India. Coronation Park. New Year's Day, 1903. It's the largest and most expensive coronation ceremony in modern history. The Delhi Dubar, the Mughal Empire's assembly, is reconvening to proclaim the ascension of a new emperor. Planning this took a full year. The ceremony's attended by nearly 200,000 people and kicks off two weeks of a Whoa, 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 200,000 people. When Queen Elizabeth II was coronated, I think there were about 9,000 invited guests. Of course, there were a lot of people in attendance, but still... This is a big coronation. Original rituals and celebrations. And to accommodate the festivities, a humongous temporary tent city has been set up outside Delhi. It features electricity, telephone lines, sanitation, a hospital, a rail line, a courthouse, a police force. Oh, what? This is a city, not a temporary accommodations, right? An art museum, a military parade ground, stores, dance halls, bandstands, polo grounds, and a post office that only uses commemorative Dubar stamps. Oh, geez, I hope they didn't forget anything. That is a very impressive setup right there. Um, I guess they really cared about taking care of those guests, eh? As for the new emperor of India, he will be delivered to the ceremony on a golden howdah, atop an elephant with candelabras attached to its tusks. So safe to say. Everyone who was anyone in the empire would be at this event, except the emperor himself. Now uh, that that just small detail right there. Thanks so much to Curiosity Stream for helping us share today's historical tale. Who did this new emperor think he was? I mean, what kind of person would duck out of a huge coronation, not to mention leave their extravagant MMO mount hanging? What if I told you the new emperor wasn't from the subcontinent at all? Heck, not yeah. even from Asia, <laughs> but instead from a rainy island over 4,000 miles away. And what if I told you he was also not a great warrior, but instead a lazy playboy who chain-smoked his way to an early grave? Doesn't make sense, does it? Well, consider this your first lesson in the complicated, tragic, and paradoxical history of the British conquest of India. Now, this is an incredibly popular topic, but what really makes it interesting is the fact that it's popular not only with average people, but also professional historians. See, usually the professionals in this field thumb their noses at popular historical topics because they've been written about to death. So there's not much room for original research or writing. But and that's uh, sort of how I feel about World War II, and I know it's not true. There are still a lot of things to be said about World War II, Things to be explored, things to be debated about, but still, I feel like that's a topic that has been uh, done over and over again. But I guess the conquest of India might be one of those too, I suppose. With the conquest of India, things are different. Here's a topic that's so complicated and nuanced that it's impossible to develop an authoritative text about. Not to mention this event has something that all historians love. A historical paradox, an absurd or contradictory event that defies expectations. Now, an armchair historian might say, Well, how can we have a historical paradox when we already know how history unfolded, eh? Case <laughs> closed, sir. Oh, contraire, armchair, because historians spend a good deal of their time thinking about contingency in the past. Or to put it another way, how things might have gone differently. I do love my armchair historians. Uh, I can't say I belong in that category anymore, but... Uh, you know, I love debating armchair historians, like I love debating armchair generals uh, on Discord, on Twitter, whatever. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Because thinking about contingency helps historians understand causality. What were the truly important people, events, and things that led us to where we are now? But with a historical paradox, you have an outcome that doesn't match the events leading up to that point. Kinda like with an upset in sports. Okay, for a completely random and in no way pointed example, let's say your soccer team is up 3-0 going into the second half of the Champion League final in Istanbul. You'd expect to win, right? You'd be so confident, in fact, that you would be left in utter disbelief if, in the end, your team lost. That's the kind of feel a historical paradox leaves you with. Sorry, Milan. 
and historical paradoxes draw people in, including professors, precisely because of their unfathomable nature. And with the conquest of India, we have brilliant historians who have dedicated their lives to understanding this one event and who often end up with incomplete answers. Nothing ever seems settled with the history of the conquest, and that helps to drive more interest and more interpretation. Yes, yeah, so I'm not a big fan of this whole alternate history stuff, but I am willing to explore it to some extent, and it must be explored to some extent in order for us to completely understand what were, in fact, like they said, the most important decisions, the most important events that led to this outcome. But then you have these historical anomalies, like they mentioned, a paradox that doesn't really make sense on paper, but somehow it happens anyway. I'm not sure what's the case here for India, but I guess we'll hear about it. Given all this, we're not even going to pretend to offer you a definitive version of the conquest of India. What we will do, though, is give you an introduction to the complex, decades-long process that affected billions of lives across multiple continents and three centuries, in hopes it inspires you to do more paradoxical digging of your own. So, let's start by talking about the historical paradox at the heart of the conquest, the idea that drives public interest and leads historians to dedicate their lives to this topic. How did the entire subcontinent of India become beholden to the rule of Britain? It's really quite extraordinary when you think about it. You know, Britain is not a large island by any means, and it, came, it became the largest empire in history when you look at total landmass controlled, and it's quite an extraordinary feat. A comparatively tiny island off the coast of Europe for nearly two centuries. How did a land of hundreds of millions of people come to be controlled by a preposterously small number of British administrators at a ratio of one colonial officer for every 250,000 Indians? Well, the answer can be boiled down to divide and conquer. And also the fact that there were people in India, uh, minor rulers, that played along with the British. That uh, It was sort of a willing submission to the British authorities that basically led to this outcome. That's very simplified, I know, but that's basically it. And how did a technologically advanced, culturally influential, and militarily successful society end up throwing the party of the century for an idle foreign emperor who didn't even bother to show up? How is this a paradox? Britain's conquest of India was inevitable. They had more money, better technology, more know-how and nastier diseases. Oh, I totally hear you, Army. That certainly is a common explanation for the conquest of India, and it's one you often see applied. Yes, you hear this a lot, like, uh, with different historical events that, well, we have these explanations, so of course, it's gotta be this, it can't be anything else, but history is not that black and white. I've come to learn, and many other people will come to learn, that, uh, History is an intrinsically complicated fabric of events, people, and, uh, you know, sometimes things are very much more complicated than it looks on the surface level. Rightly or wrongly, to histories of other European empires. But here, that explanation simply runs against the evidence. Because when regular contact between Britain and India began at the start of the 17th century, their roles were very much reversed. India was the technologically advanced, wealthy, cosmopolitan empire with diseases known for killing Europeans, while Britain was the provincial, insignificant, comparatively impoverished backwater. Plus, in 1600, the English Empire only included Wales and parts of Ireland. In fact, the English state barely survived the 16th century, and quite possibly would have been destroyed by the Spanish Armada, if not for a fortuitous storm. Not only were the English dwarfed at this time by imperial powers like Spain and France, but they'd often had trouble competing against even small European states like Portugal and the Dutch Republic. By the time the fabled East India Company... Yes, the history of England is quite fascinating, and <laughs> we'll get into that topic one of these days. But yeah, England for the longest time remained a mid-rank if even that European power that wasn't really in direct competition with the French or the Spanish at this point, uh, but very fast, uh, much thanks to their 
naval supremacy, they were able to quickly establish uh, massive colonial possessions across the world, and uh, the empire remained quite impressive until uh, after World War One and Two, when British um, hegemony started to fade in favor of America and the Soviet Union. Established its first trading post in India in 1618, the Portuguese had been there for over a century, while the Dutch had established an impressive trade network based out of Indonesia. So when it came to empire building in the early modern era, the English were very much and also ran of imperial powers. In contrast, India was ruled at the time by the Mughal Empire, led by the descendants of the great Mongol empires of the Middle Ages. Beginning with Emperor Babur in 1525, they established a near-complete rule over the subcontinent by 1600. While the English were trying to keep the colonists from starving in Jamestown and going through a civil war at home, the Mughal Empire determined the lives of 180 million people, or roughly 20% of the world's population at the time. They maintained huge armies made up of hundreds of thousands of soldiers, with anything equivalent not being seen in Europe until the 19th century. Their soldiers were armed with the latest flintlock- True. True. Um, the armies of Europe would only reach that size during the Napoleonic Wars, and uh, 180,000 men was considered a very large army, uh, by Napoleonic standards even, so... Uh, yeah. It took Europe a while before they could muster such numbers muskets, muzzle-loading cannons, and possessed some of the best cavalry in the world. Plus, and I cannot stress this enough, they had totally awesome armored elements. Yes. The Mughals also made use of a sophisticated administrative structure that drew power and wealth from land revenues. And through this structure, even petty nobles enjoyed a lifestyle many more times luxurious than the English monarch. And this is especially impressive when you realize that the Mughal emperors managed this system despite the fact that their kingdom was made up of an incredibly diverse collection of ethnicities, languages, and competing religious beliefs. By contrast, if- Yes, that uh, sort of reminds me of the Ottoman Empire, one of those empires we never talk about in the West, but it also has been incredibly influential in shaping the history of the West. Uh, anyways, the similarities are quite striking. The Ottoman Empire was remarkably effective at handling multiple ethnicities and religious beliefs and ensuring that they all mixed to together well and that there were no major confrontations throughout the life of the empire. And it seems like something uh, similar is going on here. If you want to know how the European monarchs of the time dealt with religious differences, well, our Thirty Years' War series yeah, can fill you in on that. Not good. So not only were the Mughals more successful than the Europeans, but their demographics meant they were playing on hard mode as well. True, the Mughals never tried to expand their empire overseas, but why leave home when you've already got all the good stuff? I mean, what drew Europeans to India in the first place wasn't a desire for conquest or to project strength, but rather a desperation for Indian commodities like pearls, gems, spices, silks, and manufactured cloth. And it's pretty much the same they wanted from China. And that led to the Opium Wars eventually, and that's a series we could check out later on. The early European trading posts in India weren't signs of Mughal weakness, but signals of strength. We don't come to you, the Mughals basically declared. You come you to us? come to us. European traders humbly petitioned Mughal emperors for permission to open fledgling trading ports along the coastline. But even successful European merchants had trouble finding any goods that Indians were willing to trade for, apart from gold and silver yeah. from the New World. And of all of these pitiful European traders begging the Mughals for access to their markets, the English at the time were unquestionably the most pathetic of the bunch. Far from being inevitable, from the perspective of the 17th century, the British conquest of India was more like outlandish speculative fiction. Like Planet of the Apes outlandish. And yet, it happened. But as you'll find out next week, the how and the why of that process is just as perplexing as the premise. But you know what? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to continuing this series. It's a fascinating topic, one I would really, really like to learn more about. And uh, I'm sure someone, I'm looking at you, chat, will comment down in the below and uh, give me some further insights into this topic. Uh, but yeah, anyways, if you liked the video, leave a like, subscribe, you all, you know, you know the drill by this point, right? Yeah, anyways, I'll see you guys next time.